Good morning. Good morning and welcome on this chilly late February day, but we are delighted that all of you have braved the cold and come out for what is going to be a very timely, interesting discussion and topic today on insurance and how it really does impact uh, just about every facet of our life and certainly all of our lives. Um, we really are delighted that you are here. I know we see many of you at each of these, and I also know we have a number of first-time folks. So thank you very much for those of you who uh, continue to come, and likewise for those of you who this is your first time. We certainly hope that it will not be your last and that we will see you regularly. We do have this series six times a year, three times in the fall, three times in the spring, and the overarching theme is on leadership. And we have our sponsors to thank for this. First Federal, First Federal folks, where are you? Thank you so much. We appreciate your generosity and your leadership on this. And this particular topic, by the way, I want to thank Amy Hackenberg. Uh, this was her idea. So Amy, thank you very much. And I would point to the tables. There is a comment card that looks like this on your table. And what we really appreciate is at the end of the program, if you'll jot any thoughts that you have about the program, but also please give us your ideas for future programs because we will be, our advisory committee will be meeting uh, uh, shortly actually this spring to plan next year. And so it's really important that we get your ideas and thoughts on future programs. Now as far as our remaining two this spring, I want to let you know what they are so you can make sure you have the dates on your calendar and that we'll see you here. Uh, we have next month, March 27th, we have Judson Lapley coming. Now you may not instantly know his name, but when I tell you about him, you will definitely remember. So Judson's going to be speaking on Lead Your Evolution, a conversation about change, transformation, and emotional intelligence. Judson was the first YouTube sensation. You may remember his Evolution of Dance video, and it's really what made YouTube kind of a household name in the year 2006. If you, and please don't do this on your phones right now, but at the end of the program, if you Google or go to YouTube and put in Evolution of Dance, you will see that it has had over 308 million views. And he's had a number of other big hits as well. And uh, through the years, he has appeared on The View, The Today Show, The Tonight Show, um, just a number of talk shows on virtually every major news outlet. He is originally from Bucyrus. His father was Dr. Tyson Pinion's favorite teacher. So that helped us get him here that in promising him a box of bratwurst. So please come on March 27th. You'll enjoy it. Bring colleagues. April 24th, we're delighted to welcome Dean Pease. Uh, coach Pease got his first college coaching start here, coaching our Oilers under the tutelage of Dick Strom. He retired last month from the Tennessee Titans, where he was defensive coordinator. And prior to that, defensive coordinator at the New England Patriots and the Baltimore Ravens. Another Northwest Ohio native, great guy, and he is really excited to come. And it will be moderated by Jerry Anderson. So uh, sure to be a great program on leadership lessons learned on and off the field. So there are registration forms you know, on your table. Also, need your help on March 19th 
and 20th, kicking off at noon on March 19th. Does anybody have any idea why this is such an important 24 hours? Oh, Brittany, Brittany. <laughs> So this is the University of Finley Day of Giving. We will kick it off March 19th at noon. Trustee Angie Briggs, who I think is here in the audience somewhere, will kick it off by ringing the bell when she makes her gift. And uh, we're going to have a whole lot of fun for 24 hours making a difference for our students. So we certainly hope you'll participate in that and also help us then with your comments and suggestions for next year. So at this time, I would like to introduce our student who is going to give prayer. Laura Harper is a junior originally from Finley. She is double majoring in accounting and finance with a minor in business management. She serves as president of the Accounting Club, and she's very active in our campus ministry. So Laura, would you please come and bless the food retroactively? Good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Harper, and I'm a junior accounting and finance double major here at the University of Finley. I've had a fantastic experience during my college career, from writing a published research paper my freshman year to serving as president of Accounting Club for the past few semesters. My participation in the Dana Scholars Program last fall helped me to realize my passion for data analytics, which I hope to turn into a future career on down the road. Outside of academics, I attend Campus Ministries Co-ed Bible Study on Tuesday nights, where I have the opportunity to fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ on a weekly basis. I'm honored to deliver the invocation for this morning, so if you would please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the privilege to gather here on campus this morning as a community. Thank you for everyone who worked so hard to make this event possible. I pray that you would be with our guest speakers this morning as they prepare to share their knowledge with us. Lord, we are forever grateful for the many blessings you have given us, most of all your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to fix our eyes on your truth and love every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. We appreciate that very much. So at this time, I'll ask our panelists to come forward while I introduce them. Uh, we're just delighted with the folks that we have on our panel today, truly a wealth and treasure trove of knowledge. Uh, Richard Highland is president of sales and innovation for Highland, a family-owned business founded in 1935. They are headquartered in Toledo and have offices in 16 different states across the United States. Pat Jackson serves as vice president and regional manager for Central Mutual Insurance Companies. Central Mutual's main office is located in Van Wert. Um, huge complex there, and they operate in 25 states. Their long history goes all the way back to 1876, so coming up on 150th year anniversary. Nick Medicken is president of First Insurance Group, which is an arm of our sponsor, First Federal Bank. They have nine offices throughout Northwest Ohio, including one right here in Finley. And our moderator today is Becky Bowman, who's president and principal agent for Bowman Ray of Insurance and Financial right here in Finley. Becky is a 2001 graduate of University of Finley. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back here on campus as a Finley graduate. Um, and I'm excited and honored to um, be the moderator of today's program. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna ask you gentlemen to uh, keep it a little more civilized than our recent uh, presidential democratic debates. <laughs> I do have no problem escorting anyone out of here, so <laughs> please, please behave. Insurance is a uh, feisty business, so I'm sure you can understand. So we'll go ahead and get started with some questions um, for the panel, and then uh, towards the end, we'll open it up with some questions from the audience. 
So gentlemen, our first question, um, what are a few of the major factors affecting the property insurance market these days? Um, well, I'll, I'll start. First of all, on the, on the Democratic debates, I mean, I, I mean that should be pay per view. I mean, <laughs> that is great entertainment. So uh, I hope they can make that a series. Um, so, you know, uh, climate change uh, is probably one of the, the the big overarching factors affecting the property market right now. Um, it's you know it's a real uh, issue. Um, we are building a lot of infrastructure on coast. Um, that infrastructure gets more expensive every year to build. Um, so the concentration of values in what we call catastrophic exposed areas is the biggest uh, issue facing the industry right now and how to deal with it and, and you know, really charge for that exposure. Yeah, I guess the only thing I, you know, the property industry right now, I, I, while in, in areas like Ohio, we, we maybe haven't seen some of the storm activity that we saw like in, in 01 and 11 in prior years. And so I think, um, but you know, overall throughout the United States, there's been a lot of activity to take place. So there's pressure on that market. Um, there's pressure on the pricing of it because not necessarily one catastrophic, catastrophic event that we typically see that we can associate with, but a bunch of smaller activity that still, when you add it all together, creates huge loss dollars. And I think you can boil that even further down to just even if you look at what you pay for your own auto insurance, right? If we're going to get it really simplistic, your occurrence, the number of accidents happening, they're going up. But what used to be a four or $500 bumper repair fix paint now has about four or five different sensors in it, which costs about $400 a pop. So that's now a $3,000 loss for a very common accident. And how many of you pay, hopefully not too many, on your own car $3,000 a year for your coverage? Probably no, no hand went up, which is a good thing. But that goes back to just some of the pressures, right? That's got to be passed along somewhere. You can, businesses rely on vehicles. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Nick, you touched on this, um, mm -hmm. but if you could, uh, I'll open up for some other factors that are also affecting the auto insurance industry other than the cost of repairs. Well, you know, the, one of the biggest in issues facing the transportation industry is uh, qualified drivers. Um, you know, we certainly have uh, more issues on the road because of uh, distracted driving. Everybody in this room's got a cell phone, and um, unfortunately, too many people use those phones while they're driving. And you couple that issue with drivers who, uh, in an industry that, quite frankly, aren't qualified to be handling the rigs that they're handling, those big, heavy pieces of equipment, and it's a recipe for disaster. Um, you'd be shocked how many even trucking accidents are caused by a distracted driver and by the truckers themselves. So um, the technology in and of itself is also one of the solutions to the problem, which is monitoring the driver's behavior and things like that. Um, there's all sorts of interesting applications out there that really do give us a lot of information about what those truckers are doing in the cab at the time and just prior to the, the an accident itself. but. Um, I think that's something that we have to deal with is training qualified drivers and, and um, making sure they're qualified when they get behind the wheel and then the distracted driving issue. Yeah, I think, um, you know, so Nick touched on the values of the vehicles. Obviously, those have, those have gone up over time. And Richard talked about distracted driving. You know, the other thing we have is, is a very robust economy. So there's a lot more cars on the road. There's a lot more cars on the road. There's a lot more trucks on the road. Um, so that certainly drives the, the frequency and severity. And, and this is my, my uh, chated insurance carrier perspective, but think about driving down an interstate and how far can you drive before you see a billboard, whether it's the hammer or some attorney saying hit by a large truck. You know, if you've been in an accident with a truck, call me. And, and you know, the 
attorney side of, of our world has become much more sophisticated. They've become much more aggressive. And obviously that just um, drives the severity of claims because, um, I mean, they drive people. They've been in an accident with a truck. They're going to call one of those attorneys because they want to get that payday. And that's part of the other problem, too, is that's where you have a high the cost of that occurrence is exponential because ev almost everybody has n at least knows one person who's been in an accident caused by distracted driving or under the influence of name your substance. Some, all of you, I would challenge you, you probably know at least one. Well, from an insurance perspective, even when you're not at fault, people will take, get very sympathetic and especially if it's in front of a jury, and then, then in those instances, the insurance carriers just want to do whatever needs to happen to, to settle the claim and get out of it because it can get very expensive very quickly. But that all impacts the rest of us because insurance is just a shared pool of risk. There actually are dollars involved in that. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that we're having an increase in uh, frequency of claims due to all of these factors as well as severity of claims. Um, so do you anticipate auto insurance rates to continue to rise or stabilize over the next couple of years or what are your thoughts on that? Mr. Pitt, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for you for the answer. Yeah, so I'm no actuary, let me get that out there. Um, but no, in certain segments of the industry certainly, if uh, in the large auto space, your heavy trucks, I mean, that, that market is very stressed right now. I mean, there's, if, if you're in a business and have large trucks, you, you know your cost of insurance is going up significantly. Um, and not only is it affecting the, the you know, underlying coverage, but if you've got an umbrella over the top of that, so higher limits of liability, that's getting very expensive as well. And in some cases, even difficult to get those, to get those additional um, layers of, of coverage just because of the number, the frequency of claims that are hitting into you know, multi, multi-million dollars. So I think heavy heavy mark or heavy truck space, yeah, it's going to continue to be compressed. You know, on the on the personal auto side, uh, you know, you hear it all. I guess it's all across the board. I I get out and see a bunch of agents, so I can get a perspective from different carriers, and it just kind of depends, I guess, on where they are in their pricing cycle. If they've taken rate over the past, maybe they're not going to need to take very much, or in some cases, I'm, I'm even hearing some carriers taking moderate decreases on personal auto. But if you're a carrier that maybe had your head in the sand and, and weren't paying attention to the trends, then you may be in a position where you've got to, got to raise your rates. So I, you know, there's just so many variables and so much analytics and that out there. I think it's tough on the personal line side to say, oh yeah, here, here it comes. But certainly commercial auto, it's, it's here to stay for a while. It's got a double down impact, right? For those of you who are college students in the room, if you've taken a business class, you've heard of cost of goods sold. Um, and if you're a business owner, you absolutely pay attention to that. That impacts your margin. Well, transportation costs, it's, I've heard it said a uh, hundred times even in my short time on this planet, everything moves on a truck. There's nothing in this country, if you look at our major industries, that doesn't require a truck to move to get to the end consumer. So we're going to pay that. Right, the business owner is going to pay it, but some portion of that cost is going to be passed back down to the consumer. So that's going to create a little bit of inflationary push there as well. The um, I'd step back for just a second because uh, this is actually from, from the insurance industry's perspective a pretty interesting time we're in right now. I've been in the business you know 30 plus years, and we get into one of what we call a hard market or when prices are going up pretty infrequently. Um, you know, it's not an industry that uh, enjoys um, uh, success very well, let me put it that way. They, they, Pat and his friends like to compete heavily. So, um, so over the last, say, 10 years, we've had a pretty steady decrease in pricing. But every year, loss cost, well, we, you know, the the loss trends in and of themselves go up by about 4%. You know, it's right now the loss cost trends 4%. So that means year over year, the same claim would be 4% more. 
but the industry had actually been cutting prices for a long time, and that's you know just across the board. For the last so maybe eight, ten months, um, certainly a year, we've seen a dramatic shift in the global property and casualty market pricing, um, and it's continuing and actually heating up even even faster right now. Um, because of the things we talk talked about, whether it's climate change or distracted driving issues, um, jury verdicts, uh, the, you know, the U.S. isn't alone in some of these jury verdicts. It's, you know, it's one of our great exports right now, going to Europe and to South America is, is our tort um, um, situation that we have here in the U.S. is popular, it's becoming unfortunately popular elsewhere. Um, We've had two 1,000 year flood events in Europe in the last two years. So, you know, these things are expensive, it adds up. Um, so we are seeing dramatic increases in about every area of property and casualty insurance, except maybe workers' compensation. I think it's one area that we haven't seen um, prices go up dramatically. So um, it's an interesting time right now, it really is. Thank you. So I've been in the business uh, 18 years now. Um, and when I first started, we had one computer. We About 95% of our correspondence were done by mail. And 100% of our uh, customer correspondence were done by phone or in person. Um, so how has the technology, uh, the, the use of that technology um, affected the insurance industry for both the uh, carrier side and also for the consumer? And where do you see that going? I, I think it's everything. Um, but we talk a lot inside of First Insurance. You want to be one place, and it's right here. 85% of all adults have one of these in their pocket. It's near, within an arm's reach at all time. And then without getting too loony tuned, you have anxiety the moment it's any farther than three feet away from your body. That is, that is fact, right? So that's where we want to be. That's how consumers want to interact. When we talk to our personal alliance group, which some of them are out here in the audience, it's north of eight out of 10 interactions with clients are almost exclusively phone or email. Right? And they want it done fast. It's not, well, you get a week, week and a half to look at this for me. You got about 48 hours before my attention is gone. So that's, that's just huge in terms of how consumers want to interact. When people have an accident, they want to know what's going to happen next. Uh, and they want to know now, and they already want their car fixed because everything's an inconvenience where you got, even though we have the exact same amount of time as ever, right, still 1,440 in a day, we got little time for anything. So it's created unique pressures, and I know the carriers are feeling it because they're constantly looking at, really, it's, it's managing expectations, right? You buy insurance, hopefully you never need it, but the moment you do, you want to know, how am I going to get made whole as fast as possible? And I know we feel it, you got to and you feel it from us because we're calling you guys going, hey, we need, we need to know yesterday. <laughs> yeah, from a carrier perspective, I mean, when you look at technologies, there's, there's really multiple angles to it. First, there's the efficiency standpoint. So, you know, we're trying to build systems that, that have pro that streamline workflow so that we can get the work done with, the, you know, the fewest amount of people and, and as quickly as possible. So there's the internal, and to put it in perspective, Central Mutual, countrywide, we've got, let's just say 600 employees. We've got like 120 IT people on staff. So, you know, 20% of our, of our people are IT to build those systems. So internally, we want the efficiencies, but then externally, you know, our, our uh, agency partners, you know, they're looking to us to, again, pick up that speed, to, to be able for us to be easy to use for their people. Um, to, to get quick responses, as Nick alluded to, but then also as it reaches out to the customers, whether it's that mobile app, whether you know whatever technology that may be, that it's the best, you know, the best in the business. Because if we can make the life easier for the agency, you know, the hope is that you know we get more business out of that transaction. So huge for the carriers. And I'll talk a little bit about you know because um, 
part of my job at Highland is innovations. We've uh, recently formed a partnership with uh, six other, seven other brokers, of roughly our size around the U.S. called Broker Tech Ventures, and we invest in startup technology for uh, the broker slash insurance space. And it ranges the gamut it, from efficiency standpoint, um, whether it's consumer to broker or broker to the carrier partner efficiency, but it's also going to be focused on safety. Um, you know, we've developed an app that I was talking about earlier for my driver safety. It monitors uh, uh, unsafe maneuvering, braking, um, you know, if they actually use the phone when they're not supposed to while in the cab or driving in the vehicle, so things like that. So technology can be, you know, used a lot of different ways um, and everything can be monitored. Uh, you, I mean, seriously, you just watch the news at night and nothing happens that's not caught on somebody's camera, um, whether it's a doorbell camera or somebody's phone or a dash cam, it's, it is just getting caught. And then, you know, in the workplace, whether it's a, you know, a, a factory setting or elsewhere, things are monitored and can be monitored for uh, worker safety and safe work environments. So that technology then gets deployed from an underwriting perspective. Is the, is the customer investing in that to make sure that their workers are safe and that and the, the public that enters their work area is also safe? And, et cetera. So it's, um, it's come to our industry a little bit later than perhaps other industries from an efficiency standpoint that um, we were talking about earlier, but from a safety standpoint, it's really starting to make some major positive impacts. I want to loop back real quick because uh, technology's absolutely disrupted the industry from just working with employers, right? from our perspectives. The buyer of insurance is more informed today than they have ever been, period. Um, and that is a good thing. Uh, it can be a bad thing, right? Because they they take such a narrow view at times, and I've, I can say that because I was a buyer when I was in HR on the EB side. Um, but it creates a lot of positive dialogue Right, so just the fact that the information's out there, it's available, people can get to it, it's created a lot of pressure on brokers and insurance companies to really deliver innovative solutions. And it'll be interesting to watch how that further just kind of advances and evolves as artificial intelligence and machine learning really start to take root in our industry. Um, actuaries are brilliant and smart people you pair them up with a machine that can learn its own and go through three years of numbers in two minutes, that's, that's the world is gonna quickly evolve in this space back to Richard's point on an individual level. Thank you. A lot of us in this room um, are volunteers. Uh, we volunteer on different uh, boards or different uh, in, in any other capacity. Um, if you're a volunteer, um, what are some things you consider and for risk? And is there insurance out there to purchase to protect yourself um, from those risks? I'll defer. I'm just insurance. I'm carrying. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's um, <laughs> it's uh, so first of all, for all those that do volunteer and and. Uh, are active in the community, thank you very much because it's important to give back. Um, at first, advice right off the top is just check the policy of the organization that you're volunteering for. Make sure that they do have uh, coverage for um, the volunteers and, and if you're on the board, uh, directors and officers insurance. And you can get extensions on your personal insurance for your volunteer activity. Um, some policies automatically cover it. Some policies you have to schedule the volunteer community service that you're doing, things like that. But um, it is available on your personal insurance as well as then just doing the homework on the organizations that you're, that you're working with. Yeah, I think everybody, if, you, if you're involved in anything, whether it's your church, 
um, or any nonprofit organization or a school or something like that, definitely talk to your own agent about your personal umbrella. And if you don't have that or you don't know what that is, it's really, um, it's an umbrella. It's overreaching over all your other forms of insurance. Um, but make sure that that's going to cover you uh, in the event of volunteering if something would happen or somebody would make a claim against you. Uh, because again, back to Pat's comment, right, there, those attorneys are everywhere. No offense to any attorneys in the room. But uh, when people are harmed or they perceive that they were harmed, they want to be made whole. And uh, your insurance has limits. And then when those limits are exhausted, you go back on the hook. They don't just go away unless you can totally settle the claim. So uh, definitely look at that umbrella. It's probably the single best way to protect yourself, your family, um, in the event of one of those instances. And it, it reaches a lot further than just volunteering. Um, so there's a lot of upside to that, but definitely have that conversation. Do you have any examples of like what risk is out there? Um, what could potentially happen in a situation when you're volunteering? Yeah, um, so one I can, I can personally attest to, um, I was part of a young leaders organization in my community and we sponsored a farmer's market and somebody tripped over a street curb um, went into a vendor's table and hurt themselves and ended up with an ambulance ride uh, and going to the hospital, x-rays, all that kind of stuff. Next thing you know, an event that we didn't even spend two grand to put together uh, turned into about a $9,000 just med pay claim. Uh, and the organization's limit was five grand. And so the rest of that had to come from someplace. Now we were able to pull in the vendor, right? And they were able to bring their med pay limit to just make it go away. But uh, if it would have been more serious, uh, we would have been on the hook. So as soon as that happened, of course, what's the first thing that happens? And I wasn't in insurance at the time. Somebody calls the insurance agent, hey, what's going on? How can we protect ourselves? I mean, now that event's huge. Over 1,200 people in the summer on a given weekend will be there in attendance of all ages. So it's really about making sure you're protected. Um, and that situation, I served on the committee that put it together. So eventually, if it would have been severe enough and those limits would have been exhausted, I would have been named at some point without question. Fortunately, it wasn't like that. Uh, but that is what you buy insurance for. It's for those extreme cases. Thank you. So we do have some students out here. Um, I don't think any of us intended to get into the insurance market or the insurance industry when we graduated college or started in the employment industry. Um, but where do you see this industry going as far as uh, future employment opportunities for um, our graduating um, college students? Well, so uh, um, I'm third generation of a, what's now a fourth generation family business. Um, our fifth generation, the oldest in the fifth generation is a freshman in college. Um, I'm the youngest of nine in my third generation group, and I had no interest in doing this for a living, none whatsoever. I was uh, uh, majored in accounting at the at the University of Michigan, and I was in public accounting when I graduated. I was moving to uh, a city with my brother, a different city, and uh, had, after been in public accounting for about three and a half years, my brother recruited me to come into the family business. Um, and I was like, you gotta be kidding me, so insurance? I was like, ugh, you know, but, it has been more fun and more rewarding than I ever could have imagined and glad he talked me into it. Um, what I love about it is the diversity of the customers. We fortunately are able to work with clients on a global platform. Um, I've 
clients with either in or within locations of in over 150 different countries and we've got partners in almost you know all of those countries that we work with it is really very very interesting industry um, that does add value to the economy there's just things come to a grinding halt if the industry goes away so I would tell you that you know Technology was going to enhance it, it's going to change it, but there's going to be a great future for insurance. I think in the state of Ohio alone, there's 50,000 um, or more jobs in the industry. So, and many of them are, the people in those jobs now are getting old, so the youth out there has a great opportunity uh, to pursue. Yeah, you know, in the industry, I think it's the same for both the carrier and the, the agency side. I mean, it is an aging work group. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge demographic within that um, segment that are my age and older, so, you know, the 50s and up. So over the next 10 to 15 years, you're going to see a lot of opportunities. Um, the, the industry right now really struggles to find people. So, you know, we're out beating the bushes every day trying to find uh, anybody that wants to come and, and work. And, and I think really the skill set, you know, I, probably a lot of people think, well, I've got to be a finance major, I've got to be, you know, a risk management major. But really, any major applies. If you've got communication skills and, and a willingness to learn, you can work in insurance because that's what it's really all about. It's about communicating with people and then learning and, and developing within it. So within, within Central, we've got, I mean, certainly we've got business majors and we've got risk management majors, but we have psychology majors. We have education majors. We've got just about everything under the sun. So I think it's, it is a tremendous industry. There is a lot of variety of things to do. It's not an industry where you get in and you're kind of pigeonholed. And you know, I went in as a claim rep. I'm always going to be a claim rep. You can move your way around the business to whatever kind of interests you. And I, I don't think there's too many businesses out there like that. And, and then also just to um, reemphasize Richard's point is insurance is not going to go away. It's going to change and, and how it's delivered and, and, and how it works, but it's never going to go away. And there's not too many industries out there today that you can say with surety that, you know what, I know that's always going to be there. I mean, when I was a kid, I probably thought that the uh, eight track tape manufacturer was still going to be in business, but, and young people, you don't know what the heck that is, but they're not around anymore. <laughs> yeah. All right? Yeah. The kids out there you're talking to yeah. don't know what you're talking How about. about. CD. How about that? CD. They don't even yeah. know that one. <laughs> uh, really, come one, come all. Um, I think, personally, anybody who has the ability to be critiqued, um, think critically, and just solve problems, humility goes a really far away uh, as well. But um, I see a massive opportunity for more fine arts students in our field because it is, it's a communication thing and how can I show you? So there's also a visual component. But you gotta be able to think creatively. You gotta be able to take those critiques, right? Because every client's going to critique you on your style, what you bring to the table, all those things. So, um, you know, the barrier to entry also, it's, it's kind of shameful to say, but it's so low because the need is so high. So even if it's something that you want to, now we'll talk to the younger crowd, it's Gary V. If you're under 30, Take a couple of years, try out insurance, move around in a couple of different fields, and if you don't like it, you didn't like it, and you haven't wasted any of your time. Because you will learn something about business and the way the economy works. Um, but if you stick it out, it can be a very fulfilling career. Very, very fulfilling career. Because there's nothing like being there for somebody in their time of need whether it's a business that's dependent on a piece of machinery to put their employees back to work and you're able to get the carrier partner involved, get the right people involved so that that major financial event becomes a non-issue. Or if you're, and this is how I got in the business uh, or knew this was the career I wanted to go into, working with somebody who couldn't handle mentally the finality of cashing a life insurance check on their spouse. And that's huge to sit there and talk to them about why their spouse 
bought that policy, what she had hoped would happen with some of the proceeds from it. It's incredible. Uh, you know, when we're in a faith organization, you talk about being a stewardship, being a steward, this is a tremendous place to be able to do that. Yeah, so the job, sounds like the job market is good right now in insurance. Um, we have a good economy. Do, does the job market fluctuate much with how the economy is going, or um, do we see big dips, you know, when? Do you want to do it? You want to go? Go ahead. I mean, so not really, um, from, at least from the broker's perspective, uh, whether the economy is, you know, good or bad. Um, businesses renew their insurance. Individuals, for the most part, renew their insurance every year because people just can't do without it and businesses can't do without it. They may adjust their programs um, or what they buy, but people buy insurance every year because it's the fiscally responsible thing to do. So we're, you know, not recession proof, um, but it's pretty resilient industry to be involved in. It. Um, that's for sure from, you know, my perspective. Yeah, from a carrier perspective, we, we don't see a whole lot of change in, in different economic cycles. Uh, the only main thing maybe I'd say is in a, in a down economy, uh, maybe you don't replace the, the turnover that you see. So, you know, I mentioned the, the, the aging workforce and the turnover you naturally see in a growing economy where your premiums are growing. You, you know, you're adding multiples of people every year, maybe in a slow economy, maybe, you, you know, some people attrition off and you don't replace. But I've never seen in my 20 years in our, and certainly at, at our company, where there was a downsizing of people because of an economic downturn. Yeah, pretty stable. I just... I look at it from our agency, other agencies that I know, the demand is just absolutely so sky high for talent, it, I, you just would be hard pressed to experience that. And even if you felt it probably in one area, you know, if you felt it on the broker side or the agent side, not going to feel it in the carrier. So you can, these are transferable skills, right? You can float back and forth. What do you predict um, will be the biggest change in the industry in the next 10 years? And, um, so the biggest change in the industry, it, it, uh, technology, it could be also on the um, regulation side. Uh, it is an industry that is still heavily regulated, particularly in the U.S. Um, and if you think about uh, the who moved my cheese moments for some industries as like Uber disrupting the taxi industry, it was, um, you could see that happening in the insurance industry where people just leap over it using, um, you know, blockchain technology and things like that to do contracts that sort of circumvent the system. Um, and that's, that area is being tested by individuals. There's a lot of non-traditional capital coming into the insurance industry right now. Um, some of it is now having to pay claims, and that non-traditional capital is also showing it doesn't really have the stomach for it. So um, this isn't an industry that you dabble in. Uh, if you sign a contract and you're signing up for property you know, limits of you know, let's just say a $750 million insurance program and your company is insuring a layer of that program, you can have a claim. And when that claim comes in, you gotta pay it. And this non-traditional capital that is now dabbling in the industry uh, is getting spooked by these weather event catastrophic losses or these massive jury verdicts um, that are impacting um, certain companies. So I, it's, it's hard to say what's going to be the, you know, the biggest factor, you know, um, you could probably, I'm guessing somebody's gonna ask about the coronavirus and, um, you know, not, it wasn't all that long ago where cyber was, you know, the, well, what is that? What's a cyber attack? Now it's a product within the industry. So it was an emerging issue. 
The industry grappled with how it was going to be dealt with, and now we've got a whole product platform dedicated to it. And so, um, you know, it, it reacts, the industry reacts quickly to things like that. Um, it has impacts on the industry. I would guess it's probably going to be something in the um, regulatory side that really dramatically shifts us. I, I absolutely think it's artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I think it's going to impact every single industry on the planet in ways people haven't even thought of yet. Um, for the insurance industry, I mean, you think about, so you got your phone on you. That phone knows more about you than anybody else on the planet. Right? It knows everything you've searched at, it knows everything you paused on, it knows every spot that you've gone to. Well, that, that is nothing but code. It's nothing but data. Well, all that stuff goes someplace. And as insurance companies and as businesses, everybody starts to learn how to use that information, machine learning will, again, take things that would take us years to accomplish and do it in a matter of minutes. Um, I think that is fundamentally disruptive to the industry as a whole. Um, it'll be really neat. I think one of the places we'll see it first uh, on the financial space, you've already heard of robo advisors for your financial planning. Um, I think that's going to come into the personal insurance space. I think that'll happen within the next five years for sure. Um, I think people will stay apprehensive, right? Because a machine, at least yet, doesn't know how to ask you, hey, that, do you have a family heirloom? Did your grandma pass down a ring that your wife now has? Those types of things. Um, but it's coming. Uh, you look at the health side of the equation, which is something that we're all uh, impacted by. We've all got health insurance as well that's fundamentally disrupting how you're treated when you go to the, the doctor's office. Um, they're asking you those questions because they're building out your profile. When the labs are run, there are machines looking at all that data to help doctors make decisions about how to best treat your care. Now they can also look into your DNA and figure out what you're more susceptible to, which is another big cost driver. Uh, for that industry. So those implications are far reaching for every area of our life that insurance touches. And yeah, from a carrier perspective, I, th I think one of the big evolutions that we're in the middle of is the use of data. Um, you know, we've always had these, these folks we call actuaries, you know, these mathematical wizards that would run data and, and look at a class of business and say, okay, here's the price you need to charge for it, which was really reactive in nature. So, you know, you write some stuff, you think you've got it priced right, they tell you you do or you don't, and going forward they adjust it. Well, now in the industry, you know, there's these data scientists. I mean, Central, two years ago, I don't know that we knew what a data scientist was. Today, we've probably got eight or ten of those people um, on our, you know, on our team. And these are like doctorates of data. And, and they take all this data that Nick's referring to and they're plowing through it. And, and what they're driving toward is the decision side. So not the after the fact, let's figure out how to price this thing. It's what's the risk that we want to write. And it's amazing where it's going. I mean, it's, it's kind of started out at a, at a higher level and it maybe was an overall class of business, but now they have the ability to drive it down to the finite risk. And, um, you know, we're an industry that probably five to 10 years ago was built upon, you know, I know Richard, he's a good guy. We should insure him. Now it's, I don't really care about Richard, let's look at his data. The data will tell us if he's a good guy or not and if we want to insure him. And, and the industry is going to just continue to push there. I mean, your Geico's and, and some of your you know, super huge carriers out there, they've been doing this for a long time, but, but every carrier is driving towards it. And I think it'll be interesting to see how they kind of find their niche because you know, everybody's going to have access to the same data. It's who can mine it the best and who can use it to make the best decisions so you're not all chasing the same stuff. Okay. So we'll go ahead at this time and um, open the, uh, the floor to questions, um, if anyone has questions for our panel. Um, so please use the microphone. 
And the please, there's two microphones um, on the floor if you'll please use those. Sir? Or speak real loud. <laughs> uh, I will. I'm a benefits guy, so I'm going to ask a PNC question. Obviously, over the last probably six months, whether you're watching Woodchucks Chuck Wood on TV, <laughs> or I'm watching two NFL football players and they're Asian argue, or the guy from Allstate Mayhem that looks dog poop and then looks Tina Face Tina Face Face. But when you talk about mining that data, I didn't realize it. But you know that they, they got those. You, you got your phone sitting there, and I'm a good driver. I'm watching my speed. I'm doing all that. That's where they're collecting the data. Yeah. So do you see the rest of the industry? Uh, I'm not, I, from a carrier's perspective, thank you. From a carrier's perspective, do you see that across the board from everybody? It has to be at some point in time. If we're collecting data, and they want to know about Ron Burns, then that's got to be. It's, it's there. Where I go from carrier to carrier, it's going to be mined, correct? Right. I mean, the, the, the risk a carrier runs, if they, if they don't get in the game with the data and, and gather and all that, is you're going to get adversely selected upon. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to pick up the stuff that everybody else doesn't want. So, so, yeah, I think carriers are in different stages. Again, your Geico's of the world are, are well advanced. They've been doing it for years. But your, your mutuals, the, you know, your mid-sized carriers, small carriers, if they're going to survive and exist, absolutely going to get in that game. I just wanted some clarity because I think when you, when you talk about mining the data, where's it going to come from? It's, come, it's coming right from that phone you got. Uh, yeah, and as my yeah. wife said, I will not qualify as a preferred driver. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. I own it. I know it. That's the way it is. Thank you. Well, yeah. And it's amazing, too, when they start to look at that data, some of the things that you would think would be a, a variable that would say they're a good driver, bad driver. It, it may not be anything you'd be thinking about. I mean, it could be whether you went to college. It could be, I mean, it, it's, I hate to even say, I, I, those data guys scare me, so I don't talk yeah, to them too and, much. But, yeah. And one of the, you know, the things, and, and Nick was sort of alluding to it, was, you know, just the value, you know, the, the, how much data is available. And then it's what we're all struggling with is the permissive use of that data. So, the, the phone, you know, and technology and everything you do is being captured. Um, our right as an industry or the insurance industry's right to use that data in setting its rates, you know, uh, modern day redlining, if you want to call it that, um, is something that needs to be decided. Now, if you sign up for the well, I'd rather have you sign up for the Heinlein app, but the, the Geico app or the whatever app, and, you're, and then you authorize your driving habits to be monitored, that's, you're, you're opting in. But just to grab the data because you happen to have a cell phone, and then they get information about your driving habits, I don't know if that's right or not. So um, those are the things that we, we societally have to grapple with. So be interesting too because you're you think about it your car is primarily nothing more than a computer if it was made within the last 10 years majority of times if you take it in it's not mechanical breakdown it was oh there was a there was an issue with the code in the computer we had to make an update um, I heard that three times last year with a prior vehicle and it's like are you kidding me uh, I'm thinking I'm gonna die because a computer messed up on me in my vehicle um, so it's there, it's available, and now your vehicles are connected, right? You're, if you gotta drive that GM vehicle, you got OnStar, they know exactly where that vehicle is at all time, how fast it's traveling, how many heartbreaks you made. They know everything. So uh, there's really kind of nowhere left to hide. Um, <laughs> one of the most disruptive things from a consumer perspective is how much time is going to be wasted when we all realize we should probably read those user agreements. We just quickly, okay, because <laughs> you give it over pretty quick. Correct. Very, very true. Very true. Question, ma'am? Yes, please. Um, good morning, gentlemen, and thank you. This has been extremely enlightening. Um, during part of the conversation, 
uh, it was mentioned about cyber and the fact that that has uh, now developed into an actual insurance product. If you could share a little bit more color about that, because I don't think a lot of folks uh, really understand where the world's going, and any sort of case studies or things that are happening in Northwest Ohio. I live in the world of cyber constantly, and my concern and what I try to do is help people understand they really need to be looking at what cyber is doing to their businesses and their personal lives, and what they should do in the insurance realm to help protect themselves. Thank you. So, um, as I mentioned, it was, uh, it's an evolving um, product uh, that started out as, uh, you know, what is it to, it originally really got caught up in being covered by directors and officers liability policies for the most part, and then it was covered in, you know, uh, property policies, and it's evolved basically to having uh, an industry insurance company response of dedicated cyber policies for the most part. You can still find it um, embedded in um, property policies uh, here and there, but for the most part, if, if you're an organization that's, that really has a significant cyber um, exposure, which most do, a dedicated um, cyber policy or language towards it is recommended. And it can be, um, you know, to protect the organization from uh, being held hostage where you you literally get ransomware, um, you know, you're, you're under lock until you pay a ransom, um, to a cyber attack that, you know, is just meant to be a malicious takedown of your system and disrupt your um, organization. So. Um, there are you know, certain carriers that have evolved products that are you know more dedicated to it than others, um, and you know I think it's definitely one of those areas that if you haven't addressed it specifically within your organization, I recommend that you do do a review there. Yeah, I think it's critical for every business to kind of take an inventory of of and have that conversation, because if you use a computer probably need some form of cyber liability coverage in one way, shape, or another because, again, you got correspondence, you got information, uh, and as soon as you get anything that's not public, readily available publicly, or public information, excuse me, um, you could be on the hook. The other thing is if, if you're a much larger business, uh, you really have to start paying attention to war and terrorism exclusions on your cyber policies. Um, the Department of Defense uh, has issued an opinion the two most popular war games they train for now are currency wars, so currency manipulation on a global spectrum to disrupt economies, uh, and also cyber wars, uh, trying to take down critical systems and how you defend and prepare against both of those. So those are things just to, to take into account as you're looking at that, is you want to make sure, um, I can't remember the, the last attack that was pretty public, but it was found out that uh, happened out of North Korea and it was a deliberate uh, attack. Well, a lot of businesses who thought they had coverage had that exclusion and it was no longer covered. So they still incurred the loss. So it's important that if you do have those types of liabilities, you're taking a look at those with your agent. And it's just, uh, real quick, that just, uh, and it's everywhere. It can be, um, you know, there's, there's kids, I guess, or whatever out there trying to hack into vehicles, you know, and yeah. see if they can, you know, shut cars down at intersections or shut them down while they're moving to think about how computerized the um, factories are now. I think I heard or read recently statistically that Toledo has more robots per capita than any other city in the nation. And it's because of the, the, how, how modern the, the factories are there now. Well, all that is subject to being attacked. Um, so it's, whether it's your car, your personal information, to you know, shutting down computers and, or um, factories and everything in between is and think what the nuclear industry thinks about every day. So it's all very, very, it's a dangerous world. And the insurance industry is by and large re responding to it um, 
in a pretty responsible way. I will just add that I, I think a lot of businesses recognize their uh, what we call first party uh, liability issues if, if your business is shut down due to intact. Um, but secondly, there's that third party liability issue that if, if your system is compromised and you need to notify 10,000 of your customers that their uh, information may be vulnerable, um, there's a huge cost to that um, that can be protected by insurance. So, um, next question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being here today, gentlemen. And I will let you know there is a trucker in the house. <laughs> All right, are you ready? <laughs> I, I, on my way in this morning, I thought, I wonder how long it would take them to get to the to uh, to uh, trucker casualty and all the problems that we're having in our industry. And right off the bat, the very first question, we're talking about the trucking industry. So yes, I live in that world every day. And any given day, I, um, God willing, I have 100 trucks, 400 trailers on the road, feeding this economy, this robust economy. Uh, and uh, delivering America's freight, delivering groceries to our grocery stores, feeding America along with our farmers, right? Uh, farmers and truckers, we kind of go together. We're like peas and carrots. When it's raining, we want it to be dry. When it's dry, we want it to be raining. Uh, just like uh, uh, the economy, we want it to be robust. It's good for us. Uh, that risk is real for our industry and I, I will add that less than 4%, one life lost at the hand of a truck I, is, is an awful, I wouldn't want anyone to live through that. The industry itself is less than 4% cause of, of an accident. So that being said, we call those nuclear verdicts in our industry. The nuclear verdicts of $40 million for a life lost. What's the cost of a life? None of us would want to put the cost of a life of a loved one um, at risk. I believe that it is a combination of the industries, both industries, trucking and insurance, working together on tort reform. So what is your industry doing about tort reform? Or how can you align with the trucking industry to affect tort reform? So um, I had a Big meeting just last uh, week on the very topic and working with the uh, legislators in D.C. Um, on the the issue of nuclear verdicts just in general. Um, and it's, it's so this isn't just a trucking industry problem we're having, um, but it's a great example of there are state issues um, relative to, you know, say like California, we got a 1% contributory negligence um, law, so you can virtually have nothing to do with the accident, but you're still gonna pay. Um, and, you know, seen some pretty horrific claims on that to um, the, the nuclear size of the verdicts that are being um, awarded in, by juries. And it is going to take just, you know, good old fashioned roll up the sleeves um, lobbying uh, in states and in Washington DC to deal with this problem. And, and as I said before, it's unfortunately, it's one of America's biggest exports right now. And we're seeing the same type of behavior coming out of Western Europe and even a few South American countries um, that it's just going to drive up the cost we, in these awards have, they make no sense I mean you can't you can't bridge the issue uh, with the award you just can't when literally you got a, uh, an attorney who will hold up a picture of you know a Mona Lisa that you know type of painting that sold for 350 million dollars and then they've got their person in a wheelchair and they're like, well, what's worth more? You know, is this painting really worth more than this? And poof, $350 million award. I mean, it's like, like well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, they, those two, they, you know, they don't even meet, they're not a related issue. So it's, it is literally what's happening out there. And I don't know the answer other than we've got to draw attention to it because it'll crush 
it'll crush the economy. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you again for being here today, gentlemen. Uh, earlier you touched on the hiring in the insurance industry, uh, what would motivate students, and you touched a lot on the economic motivations, that we're a very stable industry, that there's always jobs available. But millennials have shown in study after study after study that that's not their sole motivating factor, that they want to be able to make a difference in the world, that they want to go to a job that is rewarding on an emotional level as well as an economic one. What is it about the insurance industry, and I'm an insurance agent myself, so I'm saying this from a perspective of someone who thinks we are cool, uh, that <laughs> what is it about are. our industry that you find cool, that you find rewarding, that would make someone who's younger really enthusiastic about what we do day in and day out? I, I go back to my comment even about uh, stewardship. I can't think of a bigger uh, blessing or more motivating factor than being there with somebody in their time of need. Right? When, when an insurance policy is being used, whether it's a general liability, property, your home, your auto, your health, your life, whenever it's being used, it's a moment of need. right? And that can be hugely profound and motivating, I think, especially to the millennial uh, generation, as somebody who's a millennial myself, there's no, there's nothing quite like it, I don't think. Um, it's pretty cool to be able to stand alongside somebody when, they're, when they need a medical procedure and they can't figure out how to get the pre-auth or they don't know if it's gonna be covered or all these million questions when they just need to be focused on healing, you take that off their plate and you can help them with that. Somebody who just had a house fire, it's one thing to go, you know what, we can cut you a check, we're gonna get that house built for you again, but it's a totally different thing to talk to them about, hey, were you able to grab that photo of your dad who passed away that I know is super important to you, right? Were you able to get that? That's, that's something that artificial intelligence machine will never be able to replace, but when you talk to any other really good insurance folks or people who have made a career out of this, they all have defining moments. So I, I would encourage everybody, when, you're, when you engage with a millennial, just ask them if they've met with somebody in the insurance industry. Because I think a lot more of them, if it got on their radar, would go, that, that's something I could see myself doing. I would say that, you know, as a, a boomer, um, I don't think millennials own the concept of wanting to be rewarded beyond a paycheck. So uh, as I opened my comments earlier, this has been a really rewarding industry for me personally. I agree with Nick um, that uh, I will say our customers hate paying premiums, but they're damn glad to see you when they need the a claim paid or when it's time for a policy to respond. So that is a very rewarding part of what we do, but I would also say beyond that, this industry is immensely charitable. It's a very philanthropic industry. Um, I, you know, I know your organization gives back heavily in the community. It's, it's part of our DNA. Pat's company, there's probably not a better example than Central, so um, we all give back in our communities and work to make our communities better. Uh, you know, so I don't think that's a generational issue. I think human beings are just by and large wired that way that they want to be bigger than something than just a paycheck. So, and I think this industry really does afford that. All right, thank you gentlemen, and thank you all for having us here today. Um, it's great to be here.